getting ahead of on top of my slides. Okay, oops. Today we are talking about jumping gen servers. So yeah, um, I like what, what's that gonna be about? Um, so the, the overall topic is kind of like building really distributed application, new ways of building distributed applications. And, and today we, we, we will have a look at it from kind of like a bottom-up approach. So we, we start with the building blocks and and work upwards because I, I gave a few other talks where we did kind of like a top-down approach, um, and um, and but now kind of like I wanted to get my hands dirty and kind of like work bottom up um, because also we have a project where we really need to solve this now, at least partially. So bottom up, uh, we start with the building blocks. What kind of building blocks do we get in Erlang? Like ignoring OTP for now. Um, kind of like really basic pretty much. The most basic one is the process. We can spawn them, we can link them, tie the the the, the, the fade together. We can monitor them. Um, they, everything works. Uh, we send messages, which works uh, nicely in a distributed way. Um, a lot of um, problems um, have been solved in Erlang distribution in the past. So kind of like the this whole myth that the Erlang distribution is not working well or not scaling well, well, now it's a myth. Uh, there's no excuses not to use it because it scales very well. And we have a lot of like new things. There's no head of line blocking anymore since OTP 22. Um, we can um, basically tell nodes then to not build a fully connected mesh, which was the other blocker for large scalability. So we can actually now build like all kinds of crazy topologies of Erlang nodes where we will we will talk about this a little bit more. So what do we do with these building blocks until now? We build distributed applications. That's actually what you get from OTP. Um, of course, we do more things. We build kind of like messaging systems, pop sub systems, but it's all kind of like very structured. It's kind of like you have publish, subscribe. It's, it's very application specific and very structured how you how you build a distributed application. And uh, what the, the, the thing that actually comes out of the box um, is all, all it gives you is you can start applications on different nodes manually, more or less, or kind of like in a release. And all you get is failover and takeover of, uh, of an application when, when something fails. Well, I thought oh, maybe that's kind of boring. And I'm thinking about like, what else can we build out of this puzzle blocks? Like something more spiffy, something more esoteric. Um, so let's see, but we are not there yet. It, we, we are approaching it from the bottom up today. So the main thing is kind of like at, at the moment, we, we kind of like have our processes and we have our set of nodes and the way we kind of like map these processes to nodes is very static. Basically our processes live in a supervision tree. The supervision trees live in applications and applications get started on the nodes as releases. And that's how the process gets to the node. That's all we have. So it's all manual, basically. I mean, I can configure which release I want to boot on which node, and but that's basically it. Um, so what we what we have when we have an Erlang cluster, we also have node connections. And as you see, this is not a fully connected mesh because we don't need to do this anymore. The, we don't need to use global anymore. We have process group. Um, Actually, gives a nice um, registry for for processes um, the, because the global application, the global process registry, was the main cause for fully connected mesh requirements. So don't touch it; you don't get a fully connected mesh anymore. Um, and you can actually tell uh, the Erlang nodes to not connect. And we will see this later. But the, the thing is, the processes are kind of like unconnected. Uh, we don't know um, who is actually which process is close to each other. I mean, if we ditch supervision trees, et cetera, et cetera, and just have processes. So what we need is basically, we need the topology of the processes too. We need to maybe know which process is sending messages to which other process. Um, but we don't have that at the moment. We, we don't know that. But when would we know that, then we could actually do a kind of like automatic mapping of, of processes to nodes. 
and place them in a useful manner that we don't have kind of like running circles around our mesh, um, especially when it gets large um, and sort of thing. And then, um, I mean, if you if you really mess the process placement up, you can probably get as worse as microservices with latency. Um, but we probably have to fight to actually be as bad. Um, but if you do this right, we can still kind of like keep our Erlang advantages and and build large distributed um, applications. So um, where do we get this information? We have like a, a few specialized things. Um, um, that's um, an IDE we built that's actually running on the beam. This is, by the way, another language running on the beam, which is mentioned nowhere. So far in all the lists of languages on the beam, I probably need to get it up there. And it even has a web-based IDE. It's a PLC language for distributed PLCs. Um, so there's a standard for that and looks as a Pascal-like syntax. And, and the important thing is we have these function blocks, which we make the processes. And in the language, we actually have the topology who is talking to who. We know kind of like this output is going into this input and, and, and all these wires here are mapped to messages and these blocks are mapped to processes. So when I actually want to do this for, for this uh, programming language, which we compile to the beam and to process the messages, I know the topology and I can actually auto place those. And we are already doing this for this um, um, IDE based thing. It's not perfect yet, but we can auto place things. Um, question is, how do we get basically the process messaging topology for other Erlang stuff? And I think there's um, that we kind of like as a community, we need to look into that. Because at the moment it's mostly implicit, like which process calls which other process. I can't even see this from the supervision tree, like because you do the calls, like gen server calls across supervision trees. And and that I think for actually being able to auto place things, we need, need to make it more explicit. Um, and there we have the choice. Uh, do we want to have a de declarative approach? Do we want to declare it? Like maybe um, build, um, I, I experimented with a few of these things in the past, build a new set of, um, of um, behaviors, which actually let you declare the, the connectivity between processes or have the connectivity implicit or, or get, get, get some information out of there. And which also would give us the potential for better static checking. So let's say we have this topology and we actually know who is sending messages from where to where and when, then maybe Dialyzer could figure out like all these messaging things and actually tell us like, yeah, you're actually sending a message to this process, which they never receive, for example, or something like that, or some other static check. We, we have some other potential when we know the topology, but now we want to kind of like um, do automated uh, distributed uh, applications. So um, there we have kind of like several modes of operation. We could do a relatively static mapping, like for example, for the PLC language, we a priori know from the source code, the topology. And, and if our, our, our kind of like set of nodes um, is kind of like static, I mean, usually in, in IoT, you have like inputs and outputs connected to the nodes. And if your inputs and outputs go away, the application stops working anyway, then we could actually make, we, can, we could calculate this a priori, or we could actually do um, a calculation while we are actually starting the application to be a little bit more, um, dynamic and also save the work of actually specifying the topology. So the system could actually learn the topology of the nodes and then um, serve a few constraints and place everything um, in a nice way. And actually what we are working there in the next years in our research project also, um, in a funded project, we want to have these, this calculation of the good enough mapping of processes to, to nodes also in a distributed way. I don't want any central controller node because we don't have one. Um, we have mesh networks um, and we, we need to make it work without the central PC, uh, it, it just needs to work. So the, the calculation is actually also a distributed application which needs to auto distribute itself. So we kind of like have a hand and egg problem potentially. Um, we can do a recalculation when the preconditions change. Um, and then we can do a very dynamic mapping where kind of like you just spawn of processes and then they, they sense like, oh, it's crowded on this node. And, and they see, oh, over there, there's another node. There's not many processes over there. Let's migrate over there and, and, and do our calculations over there. 
and then you can actually add nodes and everything just expands like a gas into this, this mesh and, uh, and, and use all the compute power. Um, so um, that would be lo usually local knowledge. I would just look at my neighborhood nodes and do kind of like local things, um, glossy protocols and, and all kinds of lo local things. So we, we need, we have to suppose things and we have needs for both, but yeah. Um, here I mentioned migration. Um, so let's look at migration and so let's, have a, let's have a little bit of fun with process migration. Um, so why do we want to migrate processes? Um, if anything changes, um, nodes get crowded, nodes disappear, then we probably need to migrate processes elsewhere. I mean, when the node disappears, it's hard to migrate away from it, but maybe you need to route around it or do something. And, and, and that would allow us this uh, a dynamic self-optimizing distributed system would basically, it would be a very useful building block if, if our processes would just jump from one node to the other without disruption, basically. And we can also kind of like find new computing paradigms. What happens if we give the distributed systems researcher the right set of primitives that they don't need to struggle with message passing interface, like the Fortran numerical thing, or, or I mean, when I read papers and they, they, then they tell me like how they struggle with threads, it's like, we should give them better tools to actually do really cool research without taking care of these kind of like small things at the bottom. That's why this bottom-up approach, I want kind of like also give more, more, more paradigms to researchers to actually do really new things. And there's a, the last point um, in our IoT space, we need to adapt to motion in physical domain. So what do I mean with that? Um, um, yeah, I apologize for showing this video again. I really need to make a new video. And I think during this research project, I might have the chance to make a new video of a new demonstrator. This is an assembly line. Um, uh, we have actually something like proto grist nodes here because this is an old assembly line and an old video. And on this assembly line, we have these pallets moving. So they go around corner and they, they stop at certain points and, uh, and they do all kinds of things. Um, and, and we are working with this in this domain for a while. I just cut this short because probably many have seen the video already in past talks of me. Uh, so yeah, I apologize for re repeated video showing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I always like to show these machines because I like to see them. Um, so what we're currently building is we are building a distributed um, automated system that can do plug and produce. So you actually assemble these assembly lines and you don't have to program this flow. I don't want to go into the details here because that's not, uh, that's not the topic of the talk. It's more the motivation why we are doing this at the moment. Um, but kind of like we want to assemble these, these long assembly lines, like huge things like with hundreds and hundreds of nodes, which are connected node, node to node. So we have a mesh network between our embedded nodes and they should just, should just figure out the mechanical topology and, and make uh, and basically automatically plan the material flow in the factory. That's what we call plug and produce. And that's kind of like a product we're working on at the moment. And we're using Erlang for that and basically grist technology. Um, and to actually make this work, we need a, a simulator in the distributed system, which is called a digital twin. So the digital twin takes information from the physical world and, and actually runs a co-simulation of the physical world. But we have like only small IoT nodes. So we don't have like a beefy server where we run a huge simulation engine on. So we need to distribute this digital twin um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the mesh network uh, along the conveyor belt. Um, and, and there we kind of like have, we, we kind of like have an approach like every of these pallets that you just saw in the video um, is, is represented by, by its own process because we can have many processes pieces of conveyor belts, which kind of like have certain behavior are also um, um, uh, represented by a process. And this process uh, will probably be located close to the, the actual conveyor belt part because it needs to be connected to the sensors and actuators on the conveyor belt to actually change its state and, and update the thing. But the, the work piece carriers, they migrate along this thing. And for that, I, I of course want to migrate my simulation process that we are not talking across the whole mesh network all the time because yeah, performance would not be very good because we are talking about like thousands of these workpiece carriers and, uh, and a quite um, distributed mesh network. I need to rush on. 
So um, short shout out to the project that, that, that's paying for all this. That's called Piccolo, one of our two research projects we are, which we are currently in. Um, so that's us. There's two universities in Germany, Technik University of Munich. There's Bosch in there. Um, um, then a few British company. You might have heard of the company Arm. Um, BT is also kind of known. Um, and this is a project about in-network computing. And we are using this for Erlang in-network computing, basically. So we are interpreting this topic of in-network computing, compute, computation in, in the network itself uh, from an Erlang perspective. So let's get concrete. Um, migrating processes. So that's kind of like the minimal piece of code that you need to actually migrate processes. Um, I call this thing a process. You will see it in, in motion afterwards. Um, I, I try to keep it simpler. There's a, there are more complicated versions of this, but then kind of like the simplicity of the demo kind of like um, um, is, is not so good. So we have kind of like module that the, the sports one function make rate and migrate basically gets a node, a module, a function and arguments, um, which is kind of like simple like Erlang hibernate. If you hibernate the process, you also pass it a, a module function argument. And, and basically when it receives the next message, it would kind of like wake up and call this function. And until then it will be kind of like shrink wrapped and take as least as, as little memory as possible. So that's something that's built in. And we, we building a migrate function, adding a node in, in, in a similar way. So what we can do is basically we can just use spawn link on the node and just call this function. So we make a new process calling this function, which kind of like is passed on by our old process telling telling the thing how to continue uh, on the other node. Uh, we get a PID and then we pass this PID into this proxy loop. And basically our current process gets made into this proxy loop. So it's gone, but it's in the proxy loop now. And this is a very simplistic proxy loop now. And that's where we need more complicated things, of course. Um, it basically, when it receives any message, it forwards it to this new PID of the new process. And then it loops. So it, it, it takes the, 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 the place of the old process and sends all the messages to the new process. So how can we use this in a gen server? I have a slightly modified gen server on, on, in my demo where I actually added a little feature where we, oops, sorry, where we, I, I can't click on this, of course, because then I'm, I'm, I'm going on. I have a function migrate, which sends a message migrate. And here, when you see, this handle cost has a new thing. So you can actually have a new timeout here or you can pause hibernate here. And I added migrate and the new node. And by this, the gen server should actually go to the new node. And let's have a look at this. Um, so let me pick the right demo window because we have two demos. I hope I can show both if we have enough time. Um, I think that's the right one. Okay, so you're seeing my terminal. We have two terminal tops here. Oops, actually this didn't scale up. That's not good. Oh, that's not good. Oh, I scaled up the, the terminal window to actually make it more readable. But I'm messing up my setup now because we have a very small terminal here and a very large one there. I think I need to scale up this one and then shrink the window. Uh, that's why you should not change your demo five minutes before the talk. So sorry about that. So is this, is this visible here for everyone? Yep, good. So we have like kind of like two windows here, two terminals. Let's make this kind of like the same. And we are starting one Erlang node here, very simple. We distributed Erlang node. We call it node A. And um, and on node A, um, and yeah, let's start node B here. So that's kind of like, that's easy. So we have two distributed Erlang nodes. Um, and on node A, we need to now make sure that our gen server is loaded. So we are in the project where the gen server is in the current directory. So if I try to load gen server, then I will find a feature of OTP or of Erlang that actually said, nah, you can't load your module gen server because um, sticky directory. So this is a feature they built in that, that people who, who kind of like write their own module list and then load it, um, don't crash the system because they replace the existing module list 
So you basically can't replace gen server by accident. So, but there's a there's a way around that. Um, um, let me just cut and paste this because I'm I'm a little bit out of time. Um, so you can actually I, I look up um, code lib here. Um, where is my standard lib? I attach my eBin directory. That's where the binaries are. And you can call code unstick here, which kind of like takes away this limitation. So now I can replace my gen server locally. Yeah, I have a new gen server now. Slightly modified gen server. And uh, just to make sure that everything works, works smoothly, I'm I'm also kind of like, that's that's the gen server that you just saw, the jugs one, jumping gen server. Um, that's the one that, that can migrate. And I also load the process. The proxy thingy because that that's that's used by the underlying by the underlying thing, and then we start our gen server. So now it's running here. Here we have the pit, and now we have to prepare our other node um, because we need to make sure it has the same gen server here. So we need to do the same code unstick there and load gen server. Because otherwise the arrival would not be smooth on the other node. So this this one is sad. We don't need to look at this one anymore. Um, so um, what do I do now? Um, for one, I it would be make sense to kind of like ping the other node to make sure they are connected. So yeah, I got a pong. So we have two connected Erlang nodes now, and now I call this function in in, in the gen server on the slide. You may have noticed it. Uh, I can ask the gen server, like I send, I send it a call. This is a call which gets a reply. Where am I? Oh, I'm on node eight. Oh, fine. So let's send it over. I hope this works. So we send it the migrate call, basically migrate to node B. It says, okay, well, did it actually work? Well, let's ask it. Oh, um, actually, I, I thought I removed this one. I, I should have recompiled this one. That's just the debug thing uh, because I wanted to grab this message for the next slide. Uh, ignore that. That, that that's, not, that's just an IO format. Uh, but it actually tells us it is on node B. And this is, not, this is not fake. It is actually on node B. And I'm sending it the call message and I get the reply. OK, so that worked. I'm happy. Um, so let's go back to the slides. So what, what did happen now? I mean, a little bit of more explanation. We have, here I added a node C for just for, for, for the fun of it and to see that we kind of like there's more things to do than my very little primitive code that I showed you. But it, yeah, that, it's a piece of code that everybody can grasp very quickly. So we have the, the, the chuck server on node A and that's my shell process basically. And I'm 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 sending calls to there, and I'm, I'm sending where am I, and I get by I get back the reply. So now I migrate. It. So it goes over there. There stays basically behind stays. It kind of like turns into process, and in, into this proxy process. And I I keep sending the messages to process, and it forwards it to to, to, to the to the new gen server, which actually is living on node B now. And this one replies not back to via this path, but directly. Because with this message, I sent my, I sent my from PID. And when you send a PID over a distributed network, it, I mean, you can call gen servers over, over node uh, borders because the PIDs get translated. So the PID that arrives here is actually still pointing to this process. So everything's fine. So let's, let's, let's move on and send, send, send it in another migrate thing. So it migrates to node, G, node C. But then this doesn't work because here in my network, only those are connected and we don't have a fully connected mesh. So C can't talk to A. So that, that wouldn't work. So what we need to add to this process is um, when you migrate, you send forward and back and kind of like the, we need to kind of like go back by the proxy and we need to keep doing that. So that if you do this a lot, this is inefficient because then you, then you accrue a, a whole chain of proxies here. Um, and let's say if you have a ring of nodes and you go around like hundred times, then you then you drag behind you a chain of like um, like four hundred proxies in in a ring of four basically, and all the messages need to go so in circles all the time. 
So there's of course a, a thing that you need to do. You need to implement a, a protocol between these proxies that when this migrates over there, in this case, it can't do it, but assuming that node C would be connected to node A and it, and it, it migrate over there and you notice that it's connected, still connected, then we can actually send a message back basically, get rid of this proxy and basically tell this proxy, hey, here's my new address. Send everything now to this node. So that's kind of like, no. In this case, you actually need this process because it needs to be the repeater for the messages on this node. And that's actually where, how we can actually migrate across our mesh network and still stay connected to our original process and keep the messages, get it, getting the messages. So um, that, that was kind of like the, the unintentional leaked uh, message format. So how do we do this? Um, if you look at what a gen server does, sends actually, um, that, that, that's a message that you send in a gen call. Um, and basically it has like this, this kind of like weird atom with dollar. Don't use atoms with dollar. They're used all over OTP. Um, so don't, don't use it in your own stuff unless you know what you're doing. Um, and, and then you get the tuple, which includes a pit. So this is still on 23 because something is different on 24, but I come to that. So it, it gets the pit, which is the from pit, the sender, and, and, and basically a reference, which is kind of like a make reference, which is kind of like the faked out of the monitor call, but it needs a reference to actually see that, that the answer, it, it gets back, passed back the reference, the unique reference, that the answer actually fits to the same, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the question. And it actually, the message is, where am I? Um, so that's all we have, what we need to do in the proxy. We need to actually pattern match all these messages that we actually want to support for legacy stuff like gen servers, gen event, gen state, and whatever. It's not that many. And kind of like get out the, the from pit, make a mapping of from to two pits, basically, because we can have multiple processes asking us stuff, probably at some cache maybe, or maybe we can only have one. Uh, I'm unsure that that needs to be needs to be seen, and then kind of like replace the from pit by my uh, by our self self pit, and then you can actually it will get back the message and everything will still work. So yeah, that's the pit I got ahead of myself. So that's actually all I changed in the gen server. That's the whole diff. It's actually it's actually pretty cool that I only needed to change three lines in gen server to make it migratable. So one thing, for one thing, I kind of like added something like a pattern, like here's the pattern match for hibernate. And I, I made a pattern match for migrate for this migrate return thing. And what I do is I, do, I, I use my process and migrate it. Um, and um, I, I, I call basically gen server because this is the gen server module loop um, and, 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 then, and then the parameters. And the only thing that I else needed to do, I needed to export this function because it's normally not exported this internal loop function. And that actually works. It's amazing. I'm, I was really amazed. I mean, it took some time to find these three lines and add them, but um, um, so it's not that it was not as easy as it looks, but it's a very tiny change. Of course, there's, there's a lot of other things like concerning supervisors, concerning um, the process um, dictionary, which I didn't care of now, but for what we are showing now, this is sufficient. So in OTP, just a short shout out for something in OTP 24, um, <clears throat> there, there's a new feature, which is an optimization feature, um, which is called process aliases. So you can actually make a, an alias for a process which behaves like a PID. So you can send it things, and, uh, but it kind of just routes it through to the initial process. That's, uh, that's an optimization. Um, or um, improvement of behavior, because the problem is if you, if you, especially in a distributed setting, if you have a gen server call, um, and and uh, and basically the, the the calling process is waiting for the reply for a certain time timeout, and the the reply gets delayed because the node went down, something it took forever to compute, whatever. So it's no longer waiting; it's timed out the caller. And, and what happens when, when it's timed out? Um, it does something else, it's somewhere else in the loop. But then suddenly it basically gets these old messages. To, suddenly the node comes back up and it gets the old message. And, and then, then you need to make sure in your code that you always 
um, look at uh, only the, the, the current messages and you're not messed up by some like random message popping up in your mailbox from some past request. And that, uh, that's the reason for the analyze call because you can analyze a process and then you kind of like this pit is disappearing. It's like as if the process would be gone and the message disappears. And it, I think as, as far as I understand, I think it disappears even in a way that it's not even sent over distribution. And that's the optimization part. But maybe we could actually abuse this feature and add a feature like something like Erlang change allies. Uh, actually, I'm missing an argument here. I'm, of course, I need to pass it in allies. Should be a three argument form. So there's a, there's a bug in there. Um, I, I, I give it that allies. As I tell it, it's like, yeah, that's my new pet here. And maybe for, for the fun of it, I, I, I add a message to be sent in an atomic way uh, right after, basically, as a first message after you switch flip over, because I figured out that you would need such a message to actually sanely hand over to a new process. But that's just an optimization. We can do everything we want just with like proxy processes. But I, I thought it was a good opportunity to, to show you this, um, this, this new feature. And it's actually used in GenServer. It was made for the gen behaviors. But you can actually use it too for, um, for your own behaviors, for example. Um, now a little kind of like side uh, uh, topic uh, or a new topic. Um, we mentioned that the node topology a few times before. And if you have a very dynamic setting where nodes come and go, uh, or I don't even know the node topology because let's say I have this conveyor belt and they, somebody wires the thing up and I, I only make neighboring nodes connect to each other via the links, um, then I have no idea what the node topology is. And to actually make sure that, that I don't kind of like delete a proxy, a forwarding proxy, um, and then I break the connection or something, I need to learn the node topology. And there is actually, um, there is actually something from routing protocols. It's link state protocols. Um, it's the thing, uh, there's protocols like ISI is a link state protocol, also OSPF. Um, and I kind of like um, added um, to this graphic, um, the thing that basically every node knows its neighborhood, basically A, B, and C. A knows kind of like it has neighbors C and B. B knows B, A, and C. And this information is called a link state protocol, a link state packet, I'm sorry. That's the, that's a, the information that you actually need to get to the other nodes. And in an Erlang, in a very simplified uh, link state packet in, a, in, in the Erlang case would be a tuple with the name of the node itself, the name of all the neighbors, nodes, and then a timestamp because usually link state protocols, they expire these link states. So they, if they didn't hear from a node for a while, then you actually take this away. And what you do with these link states, you flood the network. All clear, I rush up. You flood the network, so you send this to all your neighbors and the neighbors send it to all their neighbors and then everything has everyone. And then everybody has all the information to actually get the information of the whole topology together um, in one node and that's how you learn this. So I have one more topic and that's probably just about right for five minutes. Um, I wanted to show you a little tool that I actually planned to use for the demo, but then I didn't, uh, I didn't need it because it got too complicated. It was too hard to follow, um, uh, too many moving parts, but it's an open source tool we made uh, for, and we will be using heavily in these projects. It's called Braid. It starts a cluster of Erlang nodes and you can actually wire up arbitrary topologies from a config, from a, from a simple config, and then actually control those and play with the, with the topologies all on your laptop. So that, that's the URL where you find it. Um, it's pretty basic. We are still expanding it to multi-node uh, cluster setups and whatever. And I would, want to give you a, a short demo. So what we're having here, that's basically what we do in a demo. We want to build a, a kind of like a, a ring of four nodes connected between each other. And there's a manager node. And the manager node is connected to these new nodes only by, by a hidden node connection. So that's a connection that actually doesn't show up when you ask it for nodes. You need to ask for hidden nodes specifically. And, and basically that's the normal connections are, uh, are looking like this. So if you want to test them this with education, you, it would, and you ignore all hidden nodes. So you don't like explicitly look at hidden nodes and you don't need hidden nodes for this with application anymore because there's a feature in the VM that actually, so there we can use this for the management link now. So we build this thing and I show you. So that's another demo and that's then, Pretty much the end of the talk. Can do the rest in question and answer. I need to share a break.
window. So that's a window where I kind of like, um, no, not this one. That, that's just my checker if it's, yeah, name A and B, I, that doesn't, okay. So I start Reba3 shell because it's a Reba3 project and I give it the, the name manager. So now I have a distributed node called manager. So now I'm kind of cheat a bit of, and, and do a bit of cut and paste. Uh, what I do is kind of like, I have this, these nodes here. So uh, the variable nodes get set with this information. So it has basically, uh, it's a map of maps where that's the arguments for every node and connect all false is basically the feature that I'm talking about that they don't connect between each other. And I basically tell it which connections I want to other nodes. And all I need to do to actually start a cluster. So I now I have one distributed node called manager. And now I basically say braid create and I give it this configuration and that, that can be much larger, a bit much larger. And it's done, magic. Um, so you probably don't believe me because everybody can return a PID. So I do braid multi-call as another feature. Um, so I, I do a multi-call over the cluster, basically sends, calls the same function on all nodes in the cluster. Um, that's one of the management things. And I ask it nodes. Like I ask it, which nodes do you know? And then I basically get back a map um, where I basically get for each, from each node, I get the answer. So you, this node sees these two nodes, this node sees these two nodes, and this node sees th these two nodes. So it's connected. And I also can actually ask for hidden nodes. That's an, that's an option here in, the, in this thing. If you pass it hidden, um, then it tells you only the hidden nodes. And then you see all the nodes are connected to manager. And that was this little demo. And we will use it a lot. Let me share the slides for one second more because we're probably coming to the end. So this is kind of like the outlook slide and that's kind of like heading into question answer. Um, so yeah, automated, aut automated fully distributed and dynamic process placement. I mean, talked about that. Um, you probably want topological constraints that you can actually say, oh, this process needs to actually be on this node because it's actually talking to this sensor that's wired to this node. Or you want to have patterns that you say, oh, these five processes, they actually, they actually would really like to be on a fully connected mesh. And then, and then the system could actually find a click, which is a fully connected subgraph of a, of a larger graph and actually place them there and they can all talk to each other. So you could actually place Manesia nodes uh, on, a, on a subcluster here and then talk to other stuff. Um, or you can say process diversity. You can basically say these four processes, they should actually live on different nodes all the time. Because for example, they could be doing some fault tolerance. Like if they implement Byzantine fault, practical Byzantine fault tolerance protocol, it would not be useful to have them all on the same node because then there's no fault tolerance. So you basically could, would tell them like spread out, go to four nodes, but don't be on the same node. So we could use stuff like this and we want to use it for this with IoT systems, transparent edge to cloud computation. Uh, and we want to do this with billions of processes. I mean, millions of processes is boring for Erlang, but we want to scale this up like by three orders of magnitude. And we want to figure out what else we can actually achieve like scalability wise and algorithm wise, and also AI wise, if we actually implement, for example, heuristic search algorithms for classical AI, um, uh, and, and we assume that we just have billions of processes and we don't have to kind of like manage them. They take care of themselves. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. So questions. Right. Um, Remy address, let me address the only one question from the Q&A board. Uh, Natalia says, so it's not actually migration, but spawning new processes while keeping predecessors alive. What if, what if one of the predecessors dies? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, because we linked them together. So you spotted that and that would kill your process. So you don't want to do this. So either you need to trap exit and actually my, in my gen server, I trap exit because of that. Um, either you need to trap exit and then don't do this or you use monitor instead. But I, okay. I, I, I want, actually I want the link in this direction because and that's why I use link because I really want the, the, the proxy to die um, when, the, when, the, when the target dies. But of course you can implement this as monitoring too. So yeah, well spotted. <laughs>